Perfect. Welcome to episode 28 of Friday Night Counter-Attack. It's back again with me. Uh, I'm very happy to be on the show, obviously hosting the show, because this is the week of the Euros that we're beginning. So it's just me for the time being. Everyone else will be coming on later or they're a bit busy, which is understandable. Um, but today I thought I'd preview one of the dark horses of um, the European Championships of the Euro 2020. So I thought it'd be the best time to invite one of my colleagues, my scouting colleagues, Giron. Uh, was it Giron or Geron that I pronounced your name properly? Uh, hi, uh, uh, thank you for having me. That's, uh, that's pretty close. Uh, uh, Jeroen is, uh, is, is probably the best way. Uh, you and then Run like Rooney, I guess. Ah, okay. or, or Jerome is also fine. Jeroen, Jeroen. I'm, I'm still going to... I'm sorry, you pro you pronounced my name, Hamza, perfectly fine, but Jeroen, uh, Jeroen. Uh, this is going to be the title was, of the podcast. Just Hamza, <laughs> Hamza pr not mispronouncing the guest name. My apologies. but um, Okay, I'm, I'm leaving. <laughs> Nah, nah, that's and that's the end of the podcast. Thanks very much for listening. Goodbye. And no, nah, we're not, we're not, we're not leaving just yet. We've got so much to learn from you today, Jaren. Um, but yeah, thank you very much for coming onto the podcast. Thanks very much for um, just helping us with what we're kind of kind of doing with our previews for the Euros. We're looking at certain teams by teams, and we want to learn a bit more about some of these teams um, going forward. So uh, obviously, if you're from the Netherlands, you're um, someone who we want to learn a bit more about in terms of who you are as a person. Um, so we'll start with that, then we'll go on to, um, we'll just ask a couple of questions about the Dutch side. We'll do our normal six aside um, for all-time Dutch 11. And we'll just see what kind of young players you've got coming through um, in your squad at the moment, your 26-man squad. So first of all, Jeroen, we'll just start off with like who you are and um, what is it you're doing currently at the moment? All right, cool. Uh, yeah, uh, well, thanks again for uh, for having me on, uh, on the podcast. Good stuff. Um, nice to be there. Um, so my name is Jeroen, uh, Jeroen Thijssen. I am uh, from the Netherlands, I'm born and raised in, uh, in uh, The Hague, or Den Haag. 41 years old at this moment. Um, I am responsible for the Dutch and also the German research for uh, this game called Football Manager. I've been doing the Dutch research for something like 20 years and uh, German research since FM uh, 2021. Um, actually doing that uh, with my Austrian colleague Wolfgang, so uh, uh, hi to Wolfgang, and also uh, Simon Elzima for the uh, for the lower leagues. Uh, we are running uh, yeah those uh, those leagues. Um, aside from that, um, I work on some information regarding the Dutch leagues and also the German leagues to uh, external parties. Uh, essentially uh, betting companies that uh, use my information to, uh, uh, I suppose they compile odds and uh, they, they, they amass my information and they, they work on from that. Uh, and aside from that, I am a scout. Um, at this particular moment, time of broadcast, I'm um, essentially scouting, let's say freelance, not specifically uh, tied to a club or anything like that, have done in the past. Uh, do have a bunch of contacts that I uh, speak to a lot, engage with about uh, possible players uh, for clubs or just uh, in general, like, hey, what do you think of this player? Um, also have a Dutch uh, FA license uh, as an intermediary, um, but I must admit that my focus is on scouting. So that's, well, uh, that's me briefly. That, that wasn't even brief. That was like a, a proper history and what you're doing at the moment, <laughs> the present that you're doing at the moment. But that, no, that's good to hear. I'm glad I'm glad you've gone through all of that. So we've got a football agent, we've got a football scout, we've got the head of the Dutch and the German leagues, a football manager, which is a very popular game in the United Kingdom and across the world, really, in terms of if you want to play football simulation games as well. So we've got a, a good mixture in the one person today as opposed to three separate people. So it's nice to hear that. And it's nice to hear that you everything's going well for yourself. Um, but let's get into what we're here to discuss today. We're here to discuss the Netherlands football team at the moment. They're in the European Championships. They weren't in the World Cup of 2018. Um, I just want to know your first initial thoughts on this squad, this manager, and what the kind of reaction is like at home at the moment with this team. So I just want to hear that from yourself first. Uh, yeah, so we're all... Um... Uh, we're excited to get the uh, the European Championships going, of course. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, it's a nice competition. Holland are in it, which is, uh, uh, again, nice for a change. We've, uh, we've missed out on, uh, on a couple. Um, so we're glad to be a part. 
but I think that the general consensus is that we're uh, uh, you are not going to do that great. Um, we're not that uh, uh, convinced. Uh, usually we think that we're going to uh, qualify, we're going to do well, we're going to beat the whole world or at least come close. But I think that the, uh, generally, I think the opinion on this is that we, you know, we might just struggle. Uh, either we're going to, uh, we're not even going to go past the group stage or we're going to uh, uh, finish in the, uh, what's it, in the, uh, in the second round or in the uh, one eight finals or maybe the quarters. Yeah. So generally what people believe. No, that's fair enough to hear. I think it's just due to the fact that you've got, um, well, for me, from from an outside perspective, even though I'm wearing the Dutch colours today, I'm seeing you in, the, in a group of the Ukraine, Austria and North Macedonia. So for me, the Netherlands should top that group. But I just want to know what kind of things um, that you're kind of hearing at home, like from the press, the media, um, your own scouts and colleagues as well what you kind of think of this current team, like if you are going to struggle through the group stage, why is that? Is it the manager? Is it the players? Is it the lack of players? Is it missing Virgil van Dijk at the back? I just, I just kind of want to know the reasons why you think that the Netherlands won't get past the group stage or will struggle in the next knockout round, basically. Yeah, yeah. If, if, uh, to start, if you just look at the teams, so Holland, Ukraine, Austria, North Macedonia were favourites. Um, I think Ukraine, uh, Ukraine are quite a strong side, so uh, we might not finish first and we'll be second, which is fair enough. Qualify, that's all right. Um, where could it go wrong? Um, I think the uh, the major issue could be the manager. Um, uh, Frank de Boer uh, took over from, from Ronald Koeman uh, after he went to Barcelona. Um, we failed to qualify for the World Championships and the European Championships before. But Ronald Koeman took over and we did really well, uh, got into the final at the Nations League. Um, everything went quite well. The play wasn't always fantastic, but the results were there. Frank de Boer took over and it's just been bland, really. Uh, and uh, I think it's a combination of uh, uh, different factors, of course. So it's a manager um, who just doesn't come across uh, very confident. Uh, he's made a couple of mistakes. He's not handled his play as well. There's been a couple of uh, situations that were uh, surprising in the very least. Um, for example, he informed the media that he told, uh, he called up, I think, 35 players uh, in a provisional squad. Uh, and then he told the media that he told every individual player uh, by phone, he rang them up and he said, okay, you're not in the squad this time around, but uh, I keep doing what, what you're doing, whatever. Turned out that he didn't actually uh, contact the players. He sent oh, them a wow. text. Um, that's tedious, a, isn't it? Texting yeah, the player, oh bit, yeah. You've done, you've done yeah. really well this season. You're not going to make it in my squad. Sorry about that. Because there's one yeah, or two I'm, players that I see, sorry to interrupt, there's one or two players I see in that under 21 side that I think are good enough to be in that um, starting 11 for the national team. But that's just my opinion. Um, sorry, okay. carry on. Yeah, who, who do you think those are? Sven Botman, the left footed centre back. And I think Justin Clivert's good enough to be in the squad, given the attackers you've got in there as well. Mm -hmm. Personally, yeah. personally mm -hmm. that's how I see it. Okay, yeah. Yeah, um, well, but Botman was definitely uh, looked at uh, to uh, solve one issue. And I think that might be the biggest issue as well. There's that big Verge is missing. So no Virgil van Dijk in the, uh, in the squad is definitely going to hurt us. Yeah. Um, if you specifically look at, okay, are we going to replace him with a left-footed centre-back, then uh, yes, Van Botman uh, would be an option. Um, Clivewood has been a little bit... He's been, hit, hit, he's been hit at miss and RB's Leipzig, but I'm looking at some of the players, and this might just be me, but you've got like Cody Gapko in there, uh, Bergwis, he's been okay. Um, he's been okay this season at Feyenoord, if I remember correctly, but it's just the fact that I thought with Justin Cliver, it gives another bit of an X factor in that team. He can bring something out of the blue. And it's not just reliant on Memphis Depay as that fast, pacey, uh, agile, uh, left winger, forward type player. But that mm -hmm. might just yep. be my opinion, like just seeing him in the Champions League for Leipzig. But mm -hmm. you know a bit more about that than I would. Would Burgers be a better fit than uh, Justin Cliver or Gabriel, um, perhaps? Yeah, um, I, I think what ultimately the issue will be is that um, uh, Frank de Boer will, um, at this moment, it's still not 100% clear what's going to happen, but it uh, depends on the formation that we're going to play. Uh, I think he wants to switch between a 4-3-3 three, three 
and a 532 or a 352, whatever you want to call it. Mm. Um, so if we're going to play a five men or three men defense, we're not really going to play proper wingers. No, that's true. Um, so um, we have Berghaus uh, potentially as the right winger. I think Clive is more left winger, although he can play on the right. Um, but um, essentially, we've only really got Berghaus for the right, Gakpo for the left, but Gakpo hasn't seen any action. Uh, he didn't play against Scotland. He didn't play against Georgia. Um, we've got Quincy Promes, but um, Frank de Boer did say that he's considering Promes as a as a wing back, uh, uh, as a right wing back. Although he can play uh, as a winger. So if you look at the entire squad, we actually only really have one winger in uh, in Berghaus yeah. and one in Gakpo. But Gakpo is a little bit untested. Um, Gakpo is one of those guys. I'm actually happy to have him there. Um, should you select Gakpo? Could you select Clive Could you select Ryan Barbel? Yeah, they're all options. I mean, Barbel is a player that uh, everybody's saying, oh, why are we taking Barbel? He's, he's not that good. Well, no, he's not, he's not that fantastic, but he's experienced. He's got something like 70 caps. He knows what uh, uh, what's needed from a, uh, from a left winger. But it's nice to see a young 20-something-year-old in Gakpo. Or Clive could have been an option. Or uh, Anwar Ghazi, who's done well in, uh, in the Premier League as of late. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Salim, who's on our podcast, who's not on today, he's a big Aston Villa fan. So he's been hyping up Anwar al all season. And he's been a lot better this season, especially when Jack Grealish was injured for Aston Villa. He stepped up in a couple of games, not just with goals, but assists as well. But yeah. I do think it'll be the 5-2-3 or 5-3-2 that Frank de Boer should really favour. Because for those of yeah. you who don't remember, Frank de Boer was labelled as the worst Premier League manager of all time after the four games and the four defeats that he had as well. So that was for Crystal Palace back in 2017, if I remember correctly. So that was crazy. The fact that he has also he has gone to go on for the Netherlands job as well. He's got the whole situation where he is um, literally moulding this team into his own. So that's why I'm, I'm glad he's not just sticking with that 4 3 3 that he used at Crystal Palace and that the Netherlands have used recently over time as well. It's going to be fun to see probably there's probably two or three players that i'm quite excited to, to see but it's just dependent on if they play but mm. we'll, we'll go on to that in a bit i just want to know a bit more about how you see the start in 11 like do you see the start in 11 really challenging the likes of germany france england maybe england portugal spain um i just want to know a bit about that before we get into the players properly uh Giron. yeah well for, for me france are the uh the, the clear favorites uh, i've got a fantastic squad uh, and then you've got a couple of teams that uh, yeah, that just need to uh, gel well and uh, get things their way. Portugal, uh, Belgium. Um, and then you've got the... They might do well, but I'm not really convinced. Uh, countries like England, uh, Spain. I'm not that impressed by Spain. I'm not that impressed by Italy. And then I think you can add us to Holland in the mix. Uh, did I mention Germany? Germany as well. I mean, it's going to be the luck of the the next rounds, really, where uh, where you're going to wind up. I think. Um, I mean, fr France for me are the favourites, and Holland can finish anywhere in the second round until I don't know semi-finals. We could make the finals if we're lucky, but uh, just looking at the squads, we're not. We're definitely we're definitely a dark horse there. Yeah. No, it's good. It's it's good to hear that. But again, from like a neutral point of view, like from myself, again wearing the orange of the Dutch um, today as well. Um, but going from the neutral point of view, when we saw you in that Nations League final, when the Netherlands beat England as well um, in extra time, and you went on to the final to Portugal, that was when you were shown that you were on the rise. You had a lot of strong players coming up. Is it really due to the fact that you don't have Virgil Van Dijk in your team? That is a whole different narrative for the Netherlands, or is it just the fact that you've got a couple of things like? Um, a new manager from the last time, no Virgil van Dijk, a change of system. Are there a couple of things that we have to look out for if we want to see the Netherlands progress in this tournament, uh, Giron? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's definitely, I think the biggest issue is, is, is Virgil van Dijk, who's missing. He's, uh, he's, he's really not really replaceable. Um, that's why we're also messing around with the, with the formations, 4-3-3, 4 5 3 2 to cover for, uh, for, for that issue. I mean, he's a fantastic defender, he's a leader. Um, yes, we've got the new manager, although personally, I would say with the squad that you have available, Frank de Boer should really not be a bad manager, although, I mean, he won, he won four titles in a row with Ajax, which is 
a good accomplishment. Although the big criticism was that I was boring football. Yeah. Um, I, I actually won four titles, but half the time you were looking at the games and thinking, no, oh, it's not very nice. Mm. But he's not done well since. I, I do believe he won uh, trophies with Atlanta, but uh, to be honest, I've not seen much of that. So, uh, but but yeah, um, wasn't one hundred percent enthusiastic over there either. But uh, Virgil van Dijk is the major problem. Um, I think the manager's not as important because I, I believe that players should always be able to step up in tournaments such as these. I mean, they're all pretty much all of them are good players and they know what needs to be done and uh, uh, it's, it's something they have to look at for themselves as well but um can can you field a proper lineup i think that is the biggest issue with with van dykeness and uh we have a situation in goal as well which is uh, which is not ideal um yeah you've got two original... backup keepers in in that squad yeah. like steckenberg's a backup keeper cruel he is not a backup keeper for Norwich, but he's been playing in the championship and has been a backup keeper for the Netherlands for quite a while as well. Yeah, uh, yeah we just... had a we had Sillerson, who is a, he's, he's not a fantastic goalkeeper, but he he does the job. He he would have been our first goalkeeper. Yeah, but uh, he's out of the squad. Um, he got tested uh, positively for COVID. No idea if he's seriously affected or just a, a, a different measure. But uh, uh, he's not in the squad. Uh, it's not really fully clear why, although mm-hmm. he, it is said that he was partying or he was amongst the celebrations of one of his former clubs at TV promotion. Oh, God. Uh, so, that, okay, that might not be fully professional, but, you know, you're not there. So I don't really know what ha- what went on, but uh, Frank de Boer has decided not to uh, select him and uh, Citizen's not happy. Um, so that leaves uh, Stekelenburg and Krull as uh, first goalkeepers and Marco Bizot uh, as a goalkeeper has yep. been picked as their goalkeeper. And either Stekelenburg or Krull is going to are going to play. I think it's going to be Stekelenburg based on uh, more recent performances. And he, 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 uh, he played well against Georgia, so that might give him the edge. Yeah, definitely. You can hopefully roll the, the, the uh, roll the years back to like 2010, 2012 when he was the number one goalkeeper in, in the Netherlands as well, which is good. Um, but yeah, I kind of see this team starting with a five-three-two. I think it would be better to see um, the proper wing backs in this team because that's I, I believe that's where your strengths lie. Not just in Memphis Depay, but it'd be something like how I would set the team up personally. Yeah, yeah we'll do this before the sixth side. But how I would do the team is I'd go for Tim Krul in goal. I'd go for Dumfries right wing back. I'd go for um, Owen Windal Windal left wing back. Then I go for Windal 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 Windal. Then I go for I go for Delir Ake and Devray as the three centre backs. If Daily Blind is back fit and on form, then I put Daily Blind on. I'm a Man United fan, so I want to show a bit of love <laughs> to David Blind right there as well. Um, so that's my five at the back, and then I'd go for a midfield three of. Uh, Wijnaldum, Van der Beek and Frankie de Jong. I think Graven Birch is someone that we're going to be talking about in a second or so with the young players coming through. But I think I'd like to see Van der Beek play again, being a Man United fan. I'm going to be a bit biased there. And then up front, I want to see Donjan Malen and Memphis Depay as the two strikers. I know Worker scored yesterday and de Jong's a, a, the number nine in the team, but I think it'd be good to actually stretch the opposition teams in this group stage with the likes of Ukraine, um, North Macedonia, parking the bus with their low block I believe that's something that, I, that the Netherlands can actually scare people and it gives you a, a unique attack and threat going forward. How would you start up um, the the group in the group for the Netherlands? How would you start up this this Netherlands side? Yeah, I, I think we can expect uh, maybe not Ukraine, but Austria and, and definitely North Macedonia to play uh, to play more defensively. Um, I, I think I think Ukraine would be safer to play a uh, 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 five three two formation. Um, so I'm going to uh, go ahead partially with your lineup. I think it's going to be Stake number on goal, but mm-hmm. Stake number crawl doesn't really make that much of a difference. Yeah. Uh, Dumfries and, and Weindahl are going to be the backs. Uh, De Ligt is going to be uh, going to be playing that as a definite. Uh, though he had a groin, a slight groin injury, but I think he'll be okay next week. Yeah. Um, De Vrij will probably play. And then the, the, the third one is the big question mark. Uh, Blind was very poor against Georgia. Mm. Uh, it was slow, and uh, that's going to be a problem. If if he's going to be up against Mbappe, we're going to we're going to lose five 0 Because that's so, where uh, I brought Botman in. He's a league he's a league uh, winner in in Lille as well. 
So it was his first season in Lille. He wasn't, he didn't cut the grade at Ajax. And that's why I believe that Sven Botman would have been a really good player for this Dutch team mm. and, a, and a unique player at that as well. Not just because of the left foot centre back, the fact that he has been literally in a centre back pairing with, with Jose Font for that whole season as well. Uh, but yeah, Daley Blind, unfortunately, he had that incident at the beginning of the season when he collapsed on the pitch. So I'm really happy to see him back in the squad yeah, and back playing for the Netherlands. But it's just the fact that, like, for me, again, as a Man United fan, I tend to worry about him. I'm like, oh no, when I see Daley Blind trending or when I see him online, I'm like, is he okay? Has something else happened? I'm like, it's happened twice. I don't want it to happen a third time. But I'm really happy to see Daley Blind into, into that squad as well. Sorry, so that was your defense. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, it's, it's, um, who it's was good that? to have him. It's good to have him back. I mean, he's, he's, a, he's a model professional as well. Uh, he's, he's, a, he's a great character to have uh, in, in the squad or in the team. So yeah, but he, but he, yeah, he's going to be a question mark. Uh, so he could be uh, replaced with either Nathan Ake mm. or uh, Julian Timbo, who's been who's been doing fantastic and he's actually played well uh, in those games against Scotland and Georgia as well. And he's, he's yeah he's. Not looked out of place. He's, he's played well. I uh, actually played well uh, for the Dutch team. So I wouldn't be surprised if he's going to go for uh, uh, the Licht, the Vrij, and Timber as so, a uh, centre field. Yeah, Timber is a holder midfielder, but he can play centre back. Was that right? Yeah, no, he's uh, he's a he's a back, and uh, he can play as a holding midfielder. He can also play as right back, but I think his ah, okay. preferred, preferred position is a centre back. That's cool. I didn't really know about him before, so I just had to clarify that. But thanks, that Giron. Um, who's in your midfield and who's in your attack? So mid- midfield is going to be uh, Frankie Dion. Mm-hmm. Uh, who I'm not convinced in the five-three-two formation is that he's, I don't think he's going to shine. Yeah, uh, I think he's yeah, he's gonna. I'm not sure if that's a Dutchism, but he's going to calculate himself uh, towards the team. So he's not going to be that uh, spectacular. Um, I think Frank de Boer is going to go for the safe option in Martin de Rome. Yep, which I don't really prefer. I'd, I'd rather see Rafenberg. And, Oh, Gravenberg's amazing, fantastic hands and oh, sensational good. Uh, and he's, yeah, Wijnaldum is a definite, he's absolutely going to start. Yeah. So those are the three midfielders. And then up front, the pie is, is absolutely sure that he's going to play. And it's either going to be Weghorst, which I hope is going to bring some, some passion. He's not the, the most technically gifted sound Bergkamp, Van Nistelrooy, Van Persie kind of striker, mm-hmm. but uh, he's gonna he's gonna be a handful and uh, he's a clinical finisher. Um, if Frank de Boer wants to go for a surprise, then uh, then Daniel Malen is a good shot as well. But uh, I think it's gonna be uh, the Bayern of the host. No, that's fair enough. That's good to hear, though. It's good to hear from a proper Dutch fan about how you think the team's gonna set up and how de Boer's gonna set up as well. Um, but now we're moving on to my three young players that I want to watch out for in, in this uh, Dutch team. So yesterday uh, I did a little converse, had a little conversation with another scout and colleague of mine. And I said Donjan Malin is one of the young players to watch out for in this European tournament. I put him ahead of Graven Birch and I put him ahead of, well, not, not ahead of De Litt, It's just everyone knows about De Litt by now. But I just want to know from your perspective about Matthias De Litt, Graven Birch. And I want to hear about Donja Malin from your perspective as a Dutch fan. How excited are you about these three players finally representing uh, the Netherlands at the Euros coming forward as well? And if there's any other young players you think we should have a watch for um, during yeah. the tournament? Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of funny. We've had uh, we've had a quite poor defence, uh, let's say, the last 10, 15 years. We've always a couple of players like, ah, the Dutch defence is really not that good. Mm. But, uh, I mean, we've had the Ligt coming up. I mean, sensational talent. Uh, struggled a little bit at Juventus in the beginning, but I mean, it's fair enough. Um, but the Licht is already well known now. I think you can still add Frank and Jung as a, as a talent, although already quite established. We've got Timber coming up. We've got Divine Wrench coming up. He's going to be great. Uh, there's another centre back that can play right back. Uh, he's in the other 21 spot. I wouldn't actually have mind if. Uh, uh, Wrench would have been uh, picked in the squad as well, instead of, for example, Joel Veltman, who's done really well at Brighton. Uh, Dutch people are going to say Veltman is rubbish, he doesn't belong in the squad, but now he's, uh, he's a good enough player, he's done well at Brighton. Um, he's one of those but- old-fashioned defenders as well, from what I see, because everyone expects them to be attacking full-backs and attacking wing-backs and whatever, but he's kind of like a, a classic, like even with Aaron Rambisak as a Man United player or um, Matteo Damiana in Inter Milan, he's literally just a classic fullback who's just there to defend on the on the side he can play in the middle as a center back as well he's done really well this season for brighton 
But it's just not as attacking or exciting as Dumfries, to be fair, yeah. or the other right backs at the tournament or right wing backs at the tournament. True, but true, true, he's yeah. still is yeah. good at his job. That's that's what I see about Joel Veltman personally. And he and he can do it. He can play right back. I've seen him play a couple of games now as a right back, and uh, uh, he had decent cross. He had good attacking drives, but not in the sense. Uh, like a Dumfries or uh, Lango, uh, as examples, or Hart de Boer, uh, who's not in the squad, but who can go at it for 90 minutes and uh, defend, attack, defend, attack, and just just go uh, uh, go the full game. Uh, yes, he is more traditional in that sense, for sure. Yeah. Um, so, Graven so, Birch. Let's hear about uh, Graven Birch, please, please. Uh, I, I, like, yeah. I, I know about him, you know about him, but for the average listener in the United Kingdom, not to disrespect them, I don't think they'll be watching Ajax um, throughout the whole season, maybe in the Europa League, but I don't think they've been seeing uh, Graven Birch, the, the player that you and I know can become a world superstar. But I mm-hmm. believe this tournament, he will light up if he gets a chance. But please just inform us, Jiron, about yeah. uh, Graven Birch as, as your centre midfield uh, it's dynamo. A, it's a question. I, 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 I would pick him. I would start him. Uh, the question is, will he? But um, I expect he'll get some minutes. And uh, I, I say Graven Birch is going to be a world-class player. Uh, centre midfielder can play defense. He's, I think even slightly more defensive than attacking uh, minded, but he is creative. Uh, he's got great physical shape, uh, good physique, a great body. He's uh, not super fast, but he's not slow. He's got all the right tools. Uh, Amazing he, on Football Manager as well. Shout out for you as yes, well. Yes, yes. <laughs> you probably you probably up to stats. A, for, are you up to stats <laughs> by any chance, Jeron? Uh, they, 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 uh, Grafenberg gets up every single time. Yeah, that's good. That's good to uh, hear. I mean, to, to be fair, I have I have two assistants uh, who are responsible for uh, for Ajax. But I mean, I, I watch their games too, and uh, uh, I mean, Grafenberg is. Well, I'm not going to say he's at the level of, for example, Messi or Cristiano Ronaldo or those kind of players, but he's very young and he's really, really gifted. And he's you can just see how much he is developing. And it's, it's fantastic. He's, he's uh, creative. He's got a good pass. He's got the vision. He's got the reasonable dribble. And he's actually got quite a free kick and a strike as well. He's actually, I think this, I, this I is a guy term, that has it all. Mm, I was going to say, I use this term a lot for young players, but it's actually crazy how we see a lot of young players playing in a mature way, so young. Like Jude Bellingham for England. I see him as such a young player at 17 years old. And he plays this with such a maturity. You've got um, other players around around Europe as, as like wingers and defenders, but as centre midfielders, when you see that, you're like, this guy's 17, 18, 19 years old, and mm-hmm. you're doing that f- until you're 24, 25, and you're just progressing and progressing. And it could be, like you said, uh, the Netherlands' next superstar, the next flying Dutchman of, of football as well um, in your country. Um, but yeah, anything else you have to say about uh, Gravenberg before we move on to Daniel Malen? I just I think that Khlafamek is fantastic. Yeah. Khlafamek is fantastic. Uh, yeah. And uh, comparing uh, comparing him and then if, if, if you look at Daniel Malin, uh, Daniel Malin is good. Where Khlafamek is fantastic, Malin is good. He's a good talent. He's going to be uh, a decent. He's going to be a capable. Well, he's, he already is decent. Um, he's at PSV now. Uh, 19 I goals think, this season. He did all right. 19. Yep. Yeah. Oh, I was going to say, I think he's got 17 or 18. 19. All right. Let's say just just under twenty. Mm. Um, that will need to improve, I think, next season. But um, he is a typical forward, a good striker, um, can score, has good technique, fast, uh, seems mature as well, um, good passing skills actually as well. Um, right right footed, but his left foot is not bad. Uh, he needs one more season to progress. Uh, maybe score 25, maybe even 30 goals next season, and then he can make the move up to uh, uh, to a good German side or a good Serie A side. He's not going to be an absolute star, but he's going to be uh, top half, maybe even the top three or four teams in Italy, Germany, maybe Spain. He's going to be he's going to be okay there. Yeah, he gave it a go in England uh, for Arsenal, but he just didn't cut the grade, unfortunately. But I'm glad he's got some game time and he's done really well at PSV going forward as well. So it's something that I would like to see Daniel Marlin come back to the Premier League. Personally, I think it's a, it's a fun talent to watch. And I think it's something that English fans would would enjoy. I think he'd do well at someone like, uh, let's say, for example, like an Aston Villa or an Everton or a mid-table team. Uh, no disrespect, uh, disrespect to PSV, but someone who doesn't have like European football, just kind of like PSV. Just focus on the Saturday games, maybe the cup games as well, and keep scoring for them. 
it'd be good. That's how I kind of see Donya Malin. And the last player I want to talk to you about before we move on to our six aside and we finish off the show is Memphis Depay, the flying Dutchman. Does he have what it takes to take this Netherlands team uh, further? I know his closing in on Van Persie's record has is, is gone past, I think, Van Basten, I think. Um, or is close to Van Basten and Van Nistor as well. But it's just the fact that we've seen Memphis Depay really step up, step up these last couple of years since he's been at Lyon and since he's been uh, the main man at Lyon as well. I want to see Memphis Depay shine at, at this tournament. I believe he's a very good player. We didn't get to see much of that at Manchester United, unfortunately. Uh, the change of managers, get left out the cup final against Crystal Palace. The fact that he was just being outworked by other, other players like Rashford, Martial, Ibrahimovic came in the season afterwards as well. Um, but Memphis Depay, like I said, I want him to be the flying Dutchman of this of this squad. I want to see him um, bring life into this Netherlands team again as a neutral, wearing the orange shirt. But I, I want to I, I want to see him uh, I want to see him fly. I want to see him uh, do his normal tricks. I want to see him take the take the lead. I want to see a bit more from um, the players around him to kind of support Memphis in in this tournament. But how do you see Memphis Depay? Um, do you see him scoring many goals in this tournament? I do in the group stages, but. Do you see him kind of being that leader and that spark uh, for the yeah. Netherlands? Yeah, well, uh, so, so do I. I hope he's going to be the flying Dutchman because uh, we need him. Mm. Um, uh, but yes, he's done really well. Uh, he's done really well at Lyon. He's, he's, he's also done really well internationally, both for the Dutch side and some uh, quick match. I think he scored 13 goals in his last 20 caps. Um, yeah. He had, uh, I think he had t- 10 or even more than 10 assists in, uh, in those 20 games as well. Uh, so considering that he's massively, massively important, uh, takes all the free kicks, takes uh, the majority of the corners, we, we took a penalty uh, against Georgia. Um, very, very important. And uh, if you look at the squad, I think the main question is, is who is going to be the player that's going to score the goals? And I think you're going to have to look at the pie because Bechwurst, Marlon, look the young, they're not guaranteed for goals. Yeah. The pie essentially is. And you're always going to have your your, your Van Alden. Van Alden is a, a player who, who actually scores quite well for the Dutch national side. He's got 22 goals and, and 75 caps, which is, which is very good. But uh, he's not going to be a player that's going to score four or five goals in, in, in the European tournament. The only one that I see doing that is Depay, or if uh, actually someone like Rechors really, really gets going. Yeah, because uh, Depay's but, on set pieces as well, isn't he? Like yeah. free kicks and penalties as well. So yeah. that could be uh, ever beneficial as well for, for yeah. uh, but, but we do believe that if, if the pie uh if the, the pie underperforms we're in trouble it's yeah. going to be holland ukraine nil nil holland austria nil nil holland north macedonia one nil okay mm-hmm. then we're out in the next rounds because then we'll face if we're unlucky we'll face germany we'll face italy and uh we're going to we're going to be in massive trouble then it's going to be fun games when you see against like the likes of Italy or Belgium, perhaps as well. But but yeah, that's kind of what I see with, with uh, the Dutch national team. That's why I mentioned it earlier. Like if the if the team can support Memphis with the burden on his shoulders, because Van Dijk was that guy for me that would support or even take the the weight off the pie shoulders to kind of uh, push this Netherlands team forward. But I don't see De Boer kind of doing that. I want to see the players kind of do that uh, in this tournament as well, which will make you dark horses, like I said. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that was our little review of your current squad of the current team that we're going to be going through. Now we'll just break it off to our little six aside um, of our all time six aside, uh, the Netherlands, Holland, the Dutch six aside all time. So Jeron, because you're the guest, you can start. I mean, I normally there's like two or three of us here by now, but mm-hmm. it's fine. But I'll let you start. And then I'll go for my one as well, because I, I know for a fact ours will be so different, but I've got my reasons, but you've got your own reasons as well. Uh, but go for it, Jaron. Yeah. Just a quick quick question. So the uh, the all-time six, is that like a, a specific formation of the goalkeeper? Or? No, 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 no. So basically how it works is um, our podcast, we play like five-a-side, six-a-side football. Um, yeah. So that's, what, that's why there's like six of us in total, I should say. Um, so we're used to playing on like a five-a-side pitch, like a small astroturf type pitch so we're like if you were to pick five or six players from the past and present uh to play on these pitches who, who would you pick so you can okay. pick a goalkeeper you can pick five okay. outfield players and one goalkeeper or six outfield players six strikers six defenders whatever mm-hmm. it's your choice you're on your choice okay yeah 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 cool cool yeah okay i, I went for uh sort of like a formation for an all-time six with a goalkeeper two defenders two midfielders and a forward Good man. Um, but uh, uh, you're very technical and uh, 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 great uh, passing and, and kick 
uh, proficiency really uh, looking at them and their primes as well, of course. Um, goalkeeper is going to have to be Edwin van der um, the best modern goalkeeper we've ever had. I mean, we've had great goalkeepers in the 50s, but that's before my time as well. So I'm just going to go for, for van der Sar, who's one of the best goalkeepers ever. And uh, uh, definitely for me, the best Dutch goalkeeper ever. Uh, I say two defenders, um, two smart defenders, uh, the tough, who can do anything, good pass, good shot, good technique. Maybe not ultra quick, but uh, but they've got the brains. As uh, so Ronald Koeman, uh, Barcelona days, so the speed fix, all penalties. Uh, Virgil van Dijk as a as current, tall, big, good at everything, great headers. Uh, midfield is going to be a combination of two very, very skilled, intelligent, and technical players. Uh, maybe a slight surprise, but I'm going to go for Klaus Seedorf. Okay. And uh, Leslie Schneider. Schneider, pretty much the perfect two hockey player. And up front, I'm going to go for one, and that is, yeah, it's, if I'm going to go for one striker, that's really difficult. I could go for all time. I could go for Johan Cruyff. Johan Cruyff is really the best player we've ever had. That's why I'm wearing his jumper. The number 14. I, 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 I hid the number 14 <laughs> up till this moment, but I thought I'd just reveal it there. I've been, I've been sitting like that with just the touch pad. But yeah, number 14 on my jumper for those watching. Those number 14. Yo Johan Cruyff is, is for the Dutch football person, the best Dutch football player ever. Mm. Okay, maybe maybe if you're younger, you don't really understand, you don't really appreciate Johan Cruyff that much. So you're going to go for someone slightly more modern. I have wow. to say, we at Friday Night Counter Attack, we love Johan Cruyff. We love the oh, fact that he created his own move. We, we love the fact yeah. that all of us, no matter how good or bad we are at football, we can all do it. We love the fact that um, the fact that he's on FIFA and like Ultimate Team is so good on there. But it's just the fact that he was before our time, so we never got to appreciate him properly. So like even even I said previously that like if we were to see like a a proper documentary about him, like the Maradona film or the mm. Van Bast not the Van Basten the uh, Baggio film that we saw recently on Netflix as well that'd be so cool to see just to learn more about the player not just the manager the total football all of that we just want to see learn a lot more about Johan Cruyff yeah. Um, but yeah sorry carry on there's a there's a good documentary on him uh, in, in Spanish or, or actually I should say Catalonian. Mm. Uh, it's time in uh, Barcelona. Uh, it's got a e, e un momento dado. Sorry, I probably not really said that correctly, but um, that is about that actually means at one given moment is actually uh, a Dutch saying yep. that did not exist in Spanish, but he said that a couple of times and turned into a Spanish saying because he enriched not just the Spanish language but also Spanish football. That's a little bit the, the thought behind it. Yeah, definitely. Um, but okay, um, yeah, Johan Cruyff should be in there for historical purpose. But if we go to slightly newer, and it's still that's so difficult if, if I'm going to go just for one striker. But just because he had sl slightly more magic moments than the other uh, four, so I'm going to go for Bergkamp. Dennis but Bergkamp. You can't, Dennis Bergkamp, yeah. You can't oh, really go wrong with Van Nistelrooy or Van Persie either, but I'm going to go for Dennis Bergkamp because he just he had some of the magic, magic touches that was surreal. That goal against Argentina for the Netherlands as well. We've seen loads for that Arsenal. Is, like, yeah. like my parents are Arsenal fans, and they would talk to me about Burkamp forever. Mom, oh God, please, Mum and Dad. Like, I know Burkamp's good, <laughs> but I know, I know, I don't want to go watch him at Highbury when I was when I was living in London. But no, it's just the fact that Dennis Burkamp was someone that no one appreciated until he left the game, until he left the English game, I should say. The fact that he was someone that we enjoyed as as English fans, and he was someone that added a lot of grace and a lot of um, class on the on the pitch as well. But how did you see him as like a Dutch striker um, for yourself, Sharon? Because obviously you had the 98 World Cup. How did you kind of do in like 96 and 92 when he was kind of um, in that era, I would say, just before the 98 World Cup? How did you find that in those Euro tournaments? Uh, I mean, we had, uh, we had from Boston in, uh, in 1988 when we actually won the European uh, Championships. And essentially Bergkamp, Bergkamp was the next uh, fantastic uh, forward. Yeah. Uh, it was amazing in the Dutch leagues and... Uh, it was uh, important for the the Ajax specifically as well. Uh, just after him, actually, the Clive, uh, mm -hmm. you actually followed up uh, Dennis Bergkamp. But Bergkamp was so graceful. I mean, if, if you look at pure clinical finishing, I would say, okay, maybe uh, for Mr. Roy and for Bersio are actually better. But if you look at technically what they can do with the ball, then, then Dennis Bergkamp was just so, so graceful. It's almost like ballet at times. Yeah, uh, and if you look at Arsenal, if, if you look at his goal scoring record, it wasn't that actually not that phenomenal. It was 
it was quite good, but it's not Bergkamp is not your all time best Arsenal finisher, but just what he can do with the ball is just that, that is how that is how we rem- remember him. Dennis Bergkamp was a scorer of great goals as opposed to a great goal scorer, basically. Yeah, that's how that's yeah. how I see it. Is a scorer of yeah. great goals. The goal against Leicester did really well. Argentina, obviously, I mentioned before. And there's so many others that he did in the Dutch shirt and mostly in the Arsenal shirt from what I've seen as well. Um, but just to confirm your team, you had Van der Sar, you had uh, Van Dijk, Ronald Koeman, Clarence Seydorf, Wesley Schneider, and um, not Joachim Cruyff, not... Uh, Van Nistelrooy, not Van Persie, but you went for Dennis Bergkamp as your sixth side. Yeah, I could go either Kraif or Bergkamp. Yeah. No, yeah. that's true. That's cool. Um, but yeah, here's my sixth aside. I've been thinking about it all day and it's probably one of the hardest ones we've ever had to do on this podcast because you have ridiculously talented players past and present and even in the future, like the young players coming through. Um, let's start off easy, going for one goalkeeper with Edwin van der Sar. I'm not leaving him out. He's the reason we won a second uh uh, Champions League title. He's one of the best signings Man United's ever seen. Uh, that three million pound, four million pound from Fulham in two thousand five. Uh, the fact that he's done really well for the Netherlands as well. He got them to the semi finals of her remember in the Euro two thousand four. Couple of penalty saves in the penalty shootout against Sweden, if I remember correctly as well. That was my first Euro tournament, so that's how old I am. You can tell um, by that age as well. Um, but yeah, uh, one defender, Yapstam. Love the guy. I wish we would have had him more at. Uh, Man United before having to go across to I don't know where he went was it Lazio or someone Parma he, he went Lazio. To, Lazio yeah he went for cheap and he just ended up leaving I wish we didn't sell him because he was amazing and he was part of that trouble when inside he was someone that was there in 2000 and you were 2000 sorry your host tournament as well wait he, he was okay in that team he, I'm not sure if he was there in 2004 he may have been I can't remember to be fair but he may have been there as like a, a another center back that you had as well. Um, but yeah, this is where it gets a bit ridiculous. So I've got four strikers in my team. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, first of all, Johan Cruyff, number 14, the, the man, the myth, the legend, the fact that he's done so much for the beautiful game, he's, he's kind of created the beautiful game. I believe he's one of the pioneers of football, Johan Cruyff, the fact that not just because as a player, but as a manager as well, the whole total mm-hmm. football thing. Kids these days will never understand the impact he had on football in his era, playing the way he did. I also will never appreciate it. The fact that it's now seen as common in our game in this deck in this era in this decade as well. Uh number two, Robin Van Persie. Love the guy. Absolute wonder of a left foot. Amazing at set pieces. Amazing cross over the ball. Brilliant finisher. Someone that I believe should have done better at Euro 2012. His head wasn't in the right place after that um that season of Arsenal. We ended up going to Man United and winning the league. Um, but I think he could have done so much better. I know he's like your all-time top goal scorer, but I, it would have been nice to see him win that trophy in 2010, the World Cup. Yeah, that would have been very really nice. Yeah. If, if, if Robin had finished it. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to put that's Robin a, in. I want to put a, Robin That's going to torment us for the rest of our lives, really. <laughs> that, oh, I, that at, least, Robin... at least you got to a final. We're, we're stuck yeah. with semi-finals here in England. We're stuck <laughs> with if Harry Kane were past it in that Croatia game to Sterling. So... And, that's if, and, if, and if Casillas would have worn uh, a, a shoe that was one size smaller, then it would have gone in. <laughs> exactly. If, if his parents didn't um, give him bigger feet or whatever yep. it was. <laughs> people want to create so many uh, uh, conspiracy theories of how we grew, but it's, it's absolutely fine if Casillas. Um, then we're going for Ruud van Nistelrooy, one of my favorite strikers of all time, someone who I grew up and I adored as a striker, someone I believe is someone that really, again, a lot of these modern Dutch players missed out on European glory or World Club glory, but they deserve European trophies, to be fair. Ruben Schwinn never won a Champions League. He won Premier League titles. He won a La Liga title, but he never won a a Champions League or he never won uh, an international tournament. But I believe, again, two great goal scorers in there with Johan Cruyff. And I'm going for someone that I wish would have played. I wish I would have seen play in in my era, Marco Van Basten. Mm -hmm. I, I... like for me, I love learning about like these old uh, football players from the 70s, 80s and 90s. I love learning about them. And this week, because you were on as, as a specialty, I thought I'd learn a bit more about Marco Van Basten, about the fact that he can't even walk properly now. He can barely yeah. kick a ball because he's injured because of the, the trauma that he suffered as, as a player, the injuries that he suffered. But the fact that he kind of completed a career at the age of 25, he won three Ballon d'Ors. He scored that amazing goal against the USSR in the final uh, went from Ajax to AC Milan. He kind of been there and done that. And like you mentioned with Dennis Bergkamp, he was likened to a ballet dancer, the way he would play the game of football. There's a book in the Netherlands, I think, about how he's like, likened to a swan or something. 
which is quite cool, like a children's book. But Marco Van Basten is someone that I wish I would have seen play in his heyday. He's a proper number nine from what I've seen on YouTube and learned about him as well. Um, Euro 1988, that was when you won the, the Euros, wasn't it? That was that was his, was that, that was when he scored, wasn't it? That's true, uh, yeah. That was the game against the USSR as well, yeah. Well, and his, his ankle was actually, uh, he was injured actually at that game. Um, yeah. He, he was able to play, but he wasn't fully fit. Mm. And, and they suggested that the only way that he was able to score that goal because his ankle was kind of half twisted in the But yeah, that was, I mean, I was eight years old. Um, and and now, nowadays, if I see footballers do something fantastic, I'm like, yeah, okay, that's nice. But when you're eight years old and something like that happens, and they, they, they turn into heroes, they, they turn into legends. And that was, a, it was like a, an amazing cross, the fact that he, it was in Germany, wasn't it? Was it in Germany? Uh, Yes, yes, it was. Yeah, it was yeah. In, yeah. So you want yeah. it in, oh, yes. in your, yes. your neighbours. You want it in your in your rival's back garden as well. So that must have been amazing to win. And that was uh, that was so ha- that was very very hectic because it was Holland against uh, at that time West Germany, mm. um, and I mean Germany really had the the more attitude players. And they weren't the f- the fantastic side. But they Mateus, had the, Rudy Vola. Yeah, the mean guys, yes, exactly. Mm. Mateus Vola, Alguntala, the, the tough German guys. And we yeah. had the more gracious guys in from Boston Kulit that I got, although we had Kuman and uh, Von Ireland who were able to knock the, the attackers about as well. But uh, but the, this incident between uh, Rudy Vola and uh, uh, Von got the speaking incident is historical as well. No, it, it was good to kind of research and learn a bit more about Marco Van Basten because I like when a European tournament comes around or a World Cup tournament comes around and it goes through the highlights of the past years. So you get to learn about it and it refreshes your memory. Like I've seen it obviously in the past, but when you see it properly again and again, like Van Nistelrooy scoring against Germany or that Van Persie goal against Germany or mm-hmm. you counter-attack in a lot into Euro 2004, it's nice to see and it's nice to learn about it as well. Um, even players like Patrick Kluivert we've missed out, Robin we've missed out. Um, like I said, there's loads of people we could have put, it, put into this team. Fantastic, as well. fantastic players. Yeah, uh, Von der Fahrt is someone you can name as well. Yeah, Jab Stom is, is, is a sensationally good defending player. And just look at how does a player have to defend. And Jab Stom is a better choice than, than Kuman or Virgil van Dijk, although I went for them because they, they're more all round. But yeah. uh, as a pure defender, then Jab Stom is phenomenal. Yeah. And and that's literally it. Even you could put the De Boer brothers in there as well. One of them is your manager, but it's just like the De Boer brothers as well. Um, but yeah, just to round it off, uh, Jerome, what we're going to just discuss, we just want to learn a bit more about um, basically how you see this tournament going. I know you, we've talked about the Netherlands a lot. We've talked about, we kind of dipped into the history there with 1988. So that was a bit of a bonus there as well. But I just want to know like your predictions for the tournament. I just want to know personally, first of all, how you think England will do as a neutral. Then we'll go into how you think the tournament will kind of go. Because you did mention at the beginning, France will be the favourites for you. But how do you see England as a neutral point of view? Yeah, I thought, well, well, France are my clear favourites, yes. Uh, England, um, England are just going to be England. <laughs> uh, it's going to be... I didn't want it's to hear that. Be, I didn't want to hear that. It's going to be okay, but it's not going to be fantastic. I, mean, uh, mm. I, I, I and am I, I'm not convinced by the, the squad. There's about five or six players that are in the, in, in the squad. I'm like, I'm actually thinking, who is that guy? Mm. Uh, I mean, and there's a couple of fantastic players. I mean, I mean Harry Kane is phenomenal, of course, just the main one. Uh, and the talent that is up and coming is just fantastic. Well, Graylish is great. Uh, uh, Alexander Arnold is great, but I, I do believe he's out, so that's a shame. But, yeah, uh, he's injured. Yeah, that's uh, that, that, that's definitely a disappointment. Uh, but I mean, you will. Uh, Croatia is going to be tough, but you will uh, you will qualify into the next round. So I don't think that will be that much of a hassle. No, I don't think so. And then and then you need a little bit of luck, but uh, it's going to be quarterfinals, and there's not going to be. That's not going to leave the English population in, in massive hype and massive joy, but uh, a quarterfinal is not going to be bad. It, it won't be bad, to be fair, but it's just the fact that because we're playing a lot of our games at home, we have a proper advantage. Like mm. in Euro 96, I wasn't, I was only two at the time. Oh, two, yeah, I'm giving away my age on, on the podcast, but I was literally like only two on the, at the time. And it's just the fact that 
um everyone like i think england beat the netherlands in 96 as well like by a couple of goals to, to one like four one or three one or something and it was just the fact that there's so much passion in the stadium so even with the fans behind us even if it's like 2000 10000 fans at wembley against croatia um and the other games that we've got as well it'd be nice to see um that we actually have a proper advantage at home yeah. in some of the games that we have so hopefully that gives us a bit of luck and it gives us a bit of um, incentive to push further because we haven't played at home since 96 and some of these players probably will never have played in a home tournament and some of these players haven't played in an international tournament as well so it's going to be fun to see how we do like we said we've got a lot of young players coming through Mason Mount, yeah, Chilwell, Mason Mount. Um, yeah. Reese James yeah. they all won the Champions League recently Phil Foden was a part of that Carl Walker mm -hmm. was a part of that final as well um, hopefully they can they can bring forward a little bit of experience in that tournament yeah to this yeah. European tournament as well. You're, you're going to need your uh, your established players. Um, <clears throat> so uh, Harry Kane, uh, who else is there? Kyle Walker. I actually don't know who you guys are going to start, but Kyle Walker, John Stones, Luke Shaw, Harry Maguire, those are your experienced guys that need to do well. And then you're going to need your Raheem Sterling. You're going to need Rashford to actually do better than they generally do because Rashford and Sterling are great players. But uh, mm. uh, I do think that Though amongst the, those guys, and Holland, the Holland national team has it quite often as well. You look at the players, they're good players, but uh, for some reason, if they're at the European Championships or the World Champions, it's just that little edge that they're missing for some reason. How, can, how can, I see can, 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 can a Jude Bellingham do a uh, fantastic count, but can he actually step up? That's how I see it. Like, I always see, every time we see an England team in the tournament, we're like, oh yeah, these are the players that we're going to have for the next two, three tournaments, but it changes the next tournament. It changes the next tournament. Like, There's always, like the players of like Jack Wilshere and Ross Barkley, Adam Lallana mm -hmm. that we had at uh, the World Cup 2014 and 16 in the Euros. They're not in the squad. They didn't, they didn't come through. Ryan Bertrand, Nathaniel Klein, they didn't come through as well. Um, Phil Jones, Smalling, they're not there anymore as well. So I it always changes. I, I love Deli Ali, but... Yeah. Yeah, mm. Dali Ali's not in the squad. Lingard's not in the squad. So it always changes. But I see that as a positive as well. The fact that we're bringing more than just the, the usual crop of players. We're, she, we're seeing a lot more talented players like Mason Mount and Jack Grealish were playing in the Championship, the league below the Premier League two seasons ago mm -hmm. in 2019. So that's always a positive. Reese James is playing in the Championship or League One last season, uh, two seasons ago as well. He's playing yeah. for Wigan there as well, which is yeah. crazy. So you've got a lot to see in, in, in these teams and in these players as well. So they've got the the hunger. It's just if they have that mental determination. I don't like the fact that Southgate chose Maguire and Henderson in this squad because if they're both injured, they're two they're two selections that I don't believe will be right. Like I don't I don't see how you can get to the tournament fitness after seeing the likes of Beckham being in there, Rooney being in there. That they just they just don't get in, in the squad and they don't get that match fitness straight away. I don't, I don't, I don't like that. Other teams don't do that. England have always failed with that, having Beckham in there, Rooney in there. Um, like I just said, it's, it's not right, but that's how I see it. Do, do you have any of your players that have been injured that you've like forced to go to a tournament and they don't really play well? Um, well, in, in, for this one, this particular tournament is going to be Daley Blinds, who is match, he's not match fit, so it's, it's, he's still going to be question mark. Mm. Uh, we've had uh, actually four years four year, oh, I was going to say four years ago, eight years ago, 2012. Robin was actually a big, big question mark, uh, but obviously Robin turned out to be quite well. Yeah. But uh, uh, so it's a tricky one, and we we were actually thinking about Spill, uh, or, or people were suggesting, why don't we take Virgil Van Dijk along? If and if he can't play, just put him in the coaching staff or something like that. Like Beckham in 2010 at the World Cup, he was just there on the coaching staff, but he didn't actually play or he was in the squad. It was one of those situations, but it's just there for moral support, really. Like Henderson's kind of there. He missed a penalty yesterday in our friendly against uh, Romania. We yeah, played against Romania yesterday in a friendly, but he missed the penalty, and it's just it's not it's not good for his confidence going into the tournament. But it is it is what it is. We have to see how it goes. Is, 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 there a, is there a player right now that's not in the England squad where you're like, oh, he should have been there? Or, or where a lot of people are like, how did he not get selected? Um, in general, not really. Um, like Alexander Arnold should have been in, but he was injured, so he had to go. Nick Pope was yeah. injured, he, he didn't go. Okay. Jamie Vardy retired from English um, duty a couple of years ago, but he's had an amazing season. But uh, Southgate didn't yeah. clearly didn't do enough to bring him back. Danny Ings. Um, 
he had a good season. He was on and off with injury as well. Personally, for me, like I wanted Fikeo Tomori from AC Milan to be in that squad. Like, if we're okay. missing a centre back, uh, like Harry Maguire, I think Fikeo Tomori would have been a better shout over Ben White from Brighton in that squad mm-hmm. as well, or Ben Godfrey, who was in that preliminary squad as well. Yeah. Um, James Ward Prowse from Southampton didn't make the final cut. We've only got five centre midfielders in that squad, Giron. So I don't see what team has ever gone into a tournament with five centre midfielders. Um, unless we're playing 3-4-3 three, three, and he wants to drop great, uh, Grealish Foden into that midfield if Rice and yeah. Bellingham are injured. But I personally don't, I don't, I wouldn't risk it with Jordan Henderson, but they've mm-hmm. gone for Ben White as the next player in, in the team as well because of Harry Maguire is still struggling with injury. But like I said, Tamori is someone I wanted to see in that, in that team um, because yeah. he, he did really well at AC Milan. He did everything he could he have possibly done. Yeah. Lingard did everything he possibly could have done at West Ham. Lingard had a great season. And Ward Prowse has had a really good season as well. It's as not, well. Yeah. People just see him as like is the the set piece expert, but it's actually very good as as a ball playing midfielder. And we needed someone different like that in our midfield. But that's kind of how I how I saw it. Ward Prowse, Lingard, and um, and Tomori would have, should have made it. But I'm very mm-hmm. happy with the players that we've got. To be fair, it'll be nice to see Bukayo Saka um, get some more game time for England. Jack Grealish, obviously, I'm a big fan of. Well, well, we're all some of us are a big fan of Jack Grealish on this podcast. Some of us are not. But we all want to see Mount Foden. Mount, see, yeah. we, we yeah. want to see these attacking players thrive. We want to see Southgate um, let them leash, let them loose, basically, and and appreciate the fact that we've got these attacking players to support Harry Kane, to help Raheem Sterling, to help Rashford and Sancho. Yeah. It'll be nice yeah, to I, see. I, if, I, if I look at the squad, I do like that uh, uh, Southgate has picked a couple of the real young players and also a couple of guys that I personally don't know that well. I mean, yeah, I've seen Ben White play, I've seen Connor Cody play, um, Calvin Phillips, but I can't say that um, uh, even Bukayo uh, uh, Saka, I've not seen that much of them. So to me, there are uh, yeah, they're slight surprises. Yeah. Um, even Rhys James, although uh, Rhys James is quite good, but uh, um, they're not obvious picks. Uh, he, he could have uh, he, he could have went for uh, your standard names and. I think it's interesting to see uh, Southgate pick uh, uh, a few of the youngsters that, uh, uh, if all turns well, they could be uh, they, they could turn into sensations. Although I think that might be more reserved to Mount Foden, maybe yeah, Grealish, maybe even Declan Rice. If, if, yeah. if we get some somebody in time, they, they could do really well. I believe they will as well. I think these this will be the the core England team for years to come. I believe it, but like I said before, it keeps changing every two three years because of the more development, which is always good. But it's just the fact that I don't see the likes of Tyron Mings and Connor Cody holding the likes of Mbappe, Lukaku, uh, Lewandowski, uh, even like Perisic and, and Rebic that we'll be seeing in, in the opening game. If they have to start because Maguire is injured, I don't see how they can do it. I'm not comfortable. I'm not comfortable with that centre back pairing. But that's kind of how I see it. Um, but to leave it in, in a lighter tone on this podcast, I've, I've very much enjoyed having you on. I just want to know three things from yourself just to end it, your own. Um, your tournament winner, I know you've said for France, which is perfectly fine. I'm going to say Portugal, uh, personally. Uh, I want to know your top goal scorer, and I want to know the person that's going to get the most assists in this tournament as well. So we've got France as one, top goal scorer, top assist. Yeah, France is going to win the tournament, I say. Um, top goal scorer, uh, I'm going to go for Lukaku, Belgium. Mm-hmm. They've got a decent group where you can get a couple goals, like two, three goals in a game, which will be good. Yeah. Uh, that, 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 that's why I'm not going for Mbappe and why I'm not going for uh, actually for Silva. Uh, for, for, for Portugal is going to be good. But uh, uh, yeah, I think they're just going to miss out on a couple of goals. It's got Germany, France, and Portugal. Yeah. Most of first. Ooh, that is a tricky one. Uh, let me quickly. No, 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 it's fine. For me, my top goal scorer, whilst you research that, my top goal scorer is going to be Harry Kane. I believe okay. he's someone that will uh, get a couple of goals against the Czech Republic, against Scotland. Uh, we may get a couple of penalties here and there, and I believe Harry Kane will, will score them, like in the World Cup, that like he did really well. My top assists um, for, for this year in, in, the, in the European Championships, I'd like to say Kevin De Bruyne. I think it, Kevin De Bruyne is a good shout to go in this tournament, but I think it might go somewhere... Um, like Antoine Griezmann, perhaps. I think Griezmann will have a field day behind the likes of Benzema and Mbappe. Um, if Giroud starts as well, sometimes as well, it'll be, it'll be nice to see Griezmann. But it'll be seeing Griezmann and De Bruyne for me personally. Yeah, yeah, it's gonna be, uh, it's gonna have to be someone. Well, likely uh, someone in the group where there's gonna be goals. 
could be mm. Belgium, could actually still be Group F because I think Hungary is going to get some butchered by three sides. Mm-hmm. Um, but maybe if, if, if Spain uh, actually uh, are able to find the goal, we're going to get an, an, an assist guy from the Spanish side. Mm-hmm. Someone like Koke or Ferran Torres, maybe Thiago, even if he gets yeah. further up the pitch. Yeah, that could well, be I think more. Moreno is going to be the the goal scorer, uh, and uh, yeah, who's going to get who's going to get him the ball? It could be Torres. Yeah, I wasn't sure about that. If Moreno would be the one starting or Morata, like Morata's normally the first. Oh, Mor- yeah. Mor- yeah. Moreno, Moreno's had a good season. Obviously, if uh, Villarreal he scored against us in the final, but um, that's kind of how I see it. It's between Moreno and Morata that first choice track of Spain um, going forward. Um, but yeah, we'll leave it there. Wait, did you pick who you were choosing for your assist? Who's your assist? Um, so I'm gonna go for uh, I'm gonna go for a Spanish player. <laughs> a Spanish player is good enough. That's cool. Um, but no, we'll leave it there. Just a few closing messages before we begin. Our new show, check it out, is on YouTube. It's out every every Friday at, at five PM, um, where we review our daily kits and we have kits from like family, friend members, and we just show off our kit collection. So find that on our Friday Night Counter Attack YouTube channel. Um, we're doing our little Sunday scout show where we get to invite our football scouts and friends on and we get to have conversations uh, going forward. Uh, we, will, we will be doing more watch longs for the European Championships on our YouTube channel as well. So look forward to that going forward. Um, we, again, we're trying to branch out and do different things as well. Um, but yeah, those are my closing messages. Check it out. And oh yeah, GoPro football. So when you get to watch us play football, that's been very successful recently. So on our YouTube channel, uh, Jerome, uh, when we play football, I put a GoPro on my head. So when we play football every Friday night, because obviously Friday night counter attack Friday night is when we play football um, together. Uh, that's when we get to uh, play our games and, and people are watching our highlights now. They're watching um, the full games, which is very exciting. I quite like it. And people quite like it as well. So thank you very much, everyone, for the feedback on GoPro Football. Uh, I'm enjoying editing it. I'm enjoying improving myself at football going forward. But um, Jérôme, do you have any closing messages? Do you have anything you want to say before uh, we round it off? Um, I'm just uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to have been a part of this. Thank you for the invites. Uh, it's fun to do. And the, uh, the hours have flown by. Uh, everybody needs to buy Football Manager. <laughs> Everyone um, needs to play with the Dutch teams on Football Manager because you'll get some amazing young talents as well. This isn't but, a plug or a paid promotion. It's just the fact that it's true. You're going to get loads of young talents players through the Dutch. That, that is, uh, uh, even not looking at FM, uh, I mean, historically, uh, yeah, the Dutch, uh, the Dutch youth set up is pretty good. Those for the German as well, German under 21 have just won the really under 21. Uh, tournament. They've got some fantastic guys coming up as well. Obviously, you've got Mukoko who was injured, but uh, mm. uh, so many, so many, so many talented players. It's just phenomenal. It's a joy. It's a joy to watch football. We we we're in a, we're in a, a, a in a period of our life where we where we can experience Messi and Cristiano Ronaldo. Um, okay, they're going to be gone in five or ten years, but there's going to be new guys stepping up, and it's going to be fantastic. It will be. It's a new age of football coming forward. And that's why I believe Portugal will win the uh, the Euros because I believe Ronaldo can inspire the new generation of Portuguese talent to come through as well. Um, but Jérôme, thank you very much for your conversation and for your time today. It's been lovely to speak to you and to see you again. Hopefully the next time we do a podcast together, I get to fly out to the Netherlands and we can actually have a conversation face to face. Um, maybe You're we could do welcome. it. At the, yeah. we, could, we could do it at the Amsterdam Arena. We could do it in Feyenoord Stadium or in Rotterdam, perhaps. I, either or, I'm, I'm, I'm easy. It, we'll, we'll do it in one of those stadiums. But no, thank you very much for your time, everyone. Thanks for listening, Jerome. Thanks again for coming onto the show. Hope you all thank enjoyed you it. Me. Everyone, enjoy the Euros coming up. By the time this is this podcast is out on Friday, enjoy the Euros. Have a lovely time, everyone. Take care and goodbye. Thank you, Jerome.